Hi, I'm Brad Wilcox. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia and a senior fellow at the Institute for Family Studies. And we're honored to have Jean Twenge uh, tonight for our uh, second Institute for Family Studies webinar. Uh, professor Twenge is a professor of psychology at San Diego State University and the author of dozens of articles, as well as six books, uh, including most recently iGen. And I really kind of noticed her work uh, when she published an article in The Atlantic about three years ago um, on the impact of smartphones on uh, the rising generation. So um, because of that, I think, article, she's gotten a lot of attention on this issue. And she's going to kind of give us now, I think, a, a sense of the research on this topic. Um, and then we're going to have time for a few questions from me and then a few questions from the audience. So without further ado, let me turn over the, um, the virtual stage here to Professor Twenge to talk about um, smartphones and uh, teens and young adults uh, today. So thank you again, Jean, for joining us on this IFS webinar. Thanks so much, Brad. So as you heard, I researched generations. Um, this is a cover of my first book, Generation Me, about the millennials. And no, that's not my stomach. I just have to clear that up right off the bat. Um, especially after three kids, but I don't know, I never really looked like that, no belly tattoos, at least not yet. Um, so the book I'm going to focus on is iGen, um, which is about today's young generation. And you notice it has a descriptive, but also extremely long subtitle. Uh, my editor actually wrote a longer version of the subtitle at one point, if you can believe that, um, just because there's so many interesting trends to discuss with this group. So, you know, people really love to talk about generations. So you've probably heard some terms in this area before, like uh, baby boomer. And I always, uh, when I give this talk in person, I ask each generation if for a show of hands. Um, and we have the baby boomers in the room hold their hands a little longer because I want everybody to see that not all of them look like these people, at least not today. So boomers were the hippies of the 60s, but then were the yuppies of the 80s and are now many of our leaders across many different fields. So then uh, we have Generation X, that happens to me, my generation. And you can get generational bonus points if you recognize the movie that this picture is from. And drum roll. Um, it is Reality Bites from 1994. And that was around the same time that Gen Xers, uh, we got a reputation for being slackers right around that time. Uh, then we have Millennials. So it took me some time to find a good picture for Millennials. I like this one because it has um, some of the technology. It also has the dude with the inexplicably strange beard, which is a, a thing. Um, and they kind of look like they're in Brooklyn, like they just ate some artisanal cheese um, or maybe some avocado toast, but eh, that's a rumor started by the internet. I don't believe that one myself. And then we have iGen. So this is today's, most of today's kids and all of our teenagers and many of our young adults born between 1995 and 2012. So you might have heard this group called Gen Z, but that's based on millennials being called Gen Y and nobody calls millennials Gen Y anymore. So I'm not convinced that's going to stick. Usually the best generational labels say something about the generation's experience. So I've called this generation iGen because they are the first generation to spend their entire adolescence in the age of the smartphone. So because they're in their formative years during this coronavirus outbreak, maybe something related to that will be their name as well. Although I would not blame them if they did not want to be named after this experience or this virus. So we'll see what the final name of this generation um, ends up being. But they have been very shaped by the rise of technology, social media, and the smartphone. So I have a front row seat for iGen in my own house. Those are my three daughters. So my oldest um, is 13. Um, so she's one of the few kids in her class who doesn't have a smartphone yet, and we'll get her one eventually. We did tell her that if that became a problem, that we could get her a flip phone instead. And then she said, mom, a flip phone is more embarrassing than no phone. So she has no phone at least at the moment. Um, and my 10 year old, well, 10 is now the average age to get your first smartphone. So that age has gotten younger and younger. And 
the eight-year-old, yep, there's people in her class in second grade who have their own phone as well as their own social media account. And so that's where we are right now. So how can we really figure out? We're gonna to try to figure out generational trends, um, also look at how technology, big cultural events, all of these things you know, have an impact on people. You know, what's the best way to do that? There's a number of ways to do it. The way that I think makes the most sense is to go straight to the source and ask teens and college students and young adults how they spend their time and how they're feeling and what's important to them. And fortunately, there have been several large and nationally representative surveys that have done that. Even better, some of those surveys go back decades. And that is really powerful because it means we can zero in on each generation when they were young. We can take age out of the equation and figure out what's truly a generational or cultural difference as opposed to just being young. These are also very large surveys. You put them all together. They total to about 11 million people. So there are a bunch of generational trends that really stand out for iGen. And in my usual talk, I go into a lot more detail about what many of those trends are. Some of them are very positive. Some of them are not as positive. Some of them are probably some of both. So for example, teens take longer to grow up. They're less likely to have a driver's license or drink alcohol or have a paid job as high school students. There's a lot of trade-offs involved in that. There's some good things about that and some not so good things about that. But there's another set of trends which were very striking for this group that I started to notice right away in these big surveys that um, I've looked at for a while. Because I've, I've looked at generational differences for a long time, about 25 years. And I got used to seeing differences that were big, but they'd take a decade or two to get there. Then around 2011 or 2012, in these big data sets, I started to notice changes that were bigger and more sudden. I had really never seen anything like it. So for example, more teens started to say that they felt left out. More started to say they felt lonely. More started to say they felt like they couldn't do anything right, or that their life wasn't useful, that they didn't enjoy life. And these are classic symptoms of depression. I wondered if this would show up in other places, because these traits here, these are fairly mild symptoms of depression. They don't reach any kind of level where they'd necessarily be clinical depression, but there's other surveys that have been able to look at that. That's what major depressive episode is. That's clinical level depression that really requires treatment. This is a government funded screening survey. And Michael, if you could get um, all the other mics off or hey, we're getting a little background noise. So maybe if you get all the other, other uh, everybody else muted so we can um, not have the background noise, thanks. So this big survey um, looks at the criteria for clinical level depression. And here's what it looks like. For 12 to 17 year olds, it's basically unchanged until right around that same point as in the other surveys, 2011 or 2012. And this is a big shift. Between 2011 and 2018, it goes from 8% to more than 14. That's about a 65% jump in just seven years. For 18 to 25 year olds, it takes, oh, now it looks like I'm muted. Can you still hear me? Give me a thumbs up if we're good, okay. Um, 18 to 25 year old young adults, it takes another year or two to catch up, but it's now reached the same level as the teens. So it's not just self-report of symptoms. Because I often hear this argument, well, maybe today's kids are just more willing to admit their feelings or more willing to admit that they have issues or problems around mental health. I doubt that given the way these surveys are constructed, um, most of them, their primary purpose is to look at drug and alcohol use, all of which is illegal in uh, many of these age groups. So they take great pains to make sure that these surveys are anonymous and kept that way and they get that across um, to the teens um, very clearly. But still, it would be very useful 
to have data on objectively measured behavior. And we have that. So for example, the CDC looked at emergency room admissions for self-harm behaviors as things like cutting or taking too many pills. And that's a behavior that's much more common among girls than boys. So I'll show you the data for the girls. So here's the trend. They have data going back to 2001. For 15 to 19 year old teen girls, again, some ups and downs, but it doesn't really do much until after 2010. And then for 10 to 14 year old girls, the rate of emergency room visits for self-harm tripled in just a six year period. Most tragically, this also shows up in the rate of completed suicides among adolescents. And that rate has roughly doubled over the same time period also in CDC data. I wonder if this extended to more everyday things. So for example, the 12th graders are asked questions like, how satisfied are you with yourself? So that had been on the rise since the mid 1970s until it just fell off a cliff right around 2012 and this very sudden change. There's a very similar pattern for satisfaction with your life as a whole. The same pattern shows up for happiness, for self-esteem. So it's for both positive and negative emotions, both well-being and mental health issues. There's these very striking patterns with things changing right around 2012. So when people see these graphs, this is always the question that they have. And this is the question that I had when I first started to see these patterns. What happened around 2011 or 2012 that might possibly explain this? So this was a difficult puzzle to figure out. It didn't line up with economic trends because the US economy was improving between 2011 and 2018. This was a period of sustained economic growth. Things were getting better for people economically. So it, it was mis completely misaligned with that. It was hard to think of some sort of event that happened around 2011 or 2012 and kept going in the same direction, much less something you know, that had an effect on people's day-to-day -day lives. So I puzzled over this for a long time. Then I came across a poll from the Pew Center for Research and things started to fall into place. Because you know what happened at the end of 2012? This happened. That was the first year when the majority of Americans owned a smartphone. So the first smartphone, the iPhone, was introduced in June 2007. And the majority of people in the US owned one by the end of 2012. So that's called market saturation. So we have market saturation of this technology in five and a half years. That is the fastest adoption of any technology in human history. So it makes sense that it would have an effect on people, particularly on young people, where this is the only world that they have ever known. So that's the next trend that we can discuss, the rise of smartphones and social media, but not just those things, but what they might've replaced in the lives of teens is also important. So we'll start with social media. And we can look across demographic groups to see how pervasive the change might be. This is among the high school seniors. And here's the trend in the percentage who say they use social media every day. So there it is among more advantaged teens and less advantaged teens. And you notice there's now very little difference. The smartphone has collapsed a lot of the internet gap that used to exist by social class. There's also a very similar pattern across racial and ethnic groups. We do see a little bit of a difference is the boys versus the girls. Now the boys are not up the hook because how are they spending their digital media time? Gaming, right? But even for the guys, the trend is similar. That social media moves from being something that about half of teens were doing every day to something almost all of them were doing every day, particularly among girls where it's at 90% in the most recent data. So overall, the amount of time that teens say they spend online has doubled since 2006. And if you add together the amount of time they say they spend texting online and on social media, so just three activities and just during leisure time, not counting work or homework, it adds up to six hours a day. More comprehensive surveys that include more types of technology use 
suggests the number's closer to eight or even nine hours a day. So no matter which of those numbers you choose, that's a lot of time. So that potentially leaves less time for doing other things. So as a social psychologist by training, I was particularly interested in this question. Well, if teens are spending so much time interacting through social media and texting, what happens to how much time they spend with each other face to face? So these big surveys have a bunch of questions on that, on in-person social interaction. This one's just the most general, getting together with friends informally. So we can see the trend and the percentage of teens who say they do that every day or nearly every day. And here it is across three different age groups. That's the trend for the high school seniors and the 10th graders and the eighth graders. So the data doesn't go back as far for the 10th graders and eighth graders, but the pattern is pretty consistent that you get a few ups and downs, but really it starts heading downward around 2000, but it's kind of a bunny slope. Then 2010, 2011, 2012, right as the smartphone becomes common, social media moves from being optional to mandatory, it really starts to accelerate downward. And this is a substantial change because it used to be about half of teens were getting together with their friends every day. And now it's more like one out of four. So going to parties once a month or more, shows a very similar trend, again, across all three of the age groups, much less common. And then sometimes once they get to college, even when they do go to a party, it ends up looking like this. And I know an iGen college student made that. So what about sleeping? So sleeping's another activity that technology use can potentially interfere with. So two different surveys have looked at that. He asked the question in slightly different ways, but we can put it on this same um, rubric of sleeping less than seven hours a night on most nights. So the first survey looks at high school students, ninth through 12th graders. Um, doesn't go back that far, but still shows us the pattern of again around 2011, 2013. Um, the percentage of teens who are not sleeping enough goes way up. And just for context, 14 to 18 year olds are supposed to be getting nine hours a night. So sleeping less than seven hours a night is a pretty significant amount of sleep deprivation in this age group. Now this next um, one goes back farther, shows a really interesting pattern. Big increase in not sleeping enough during the 90s. Maybe it was Xbox, maybe it was late night cable TV, who knows, some other cultural influence. But then things kind of flattened out, even got slightly better until, just like everything else, right, right around 2012, 2013, starts going up with the end result that in both of these surveys not sleeping enough is at all-time highs among teens so here's what we have as an overall picture so iGen as a generation when they're young they are spending more time on activities that involve a screen and less time on activities that don't involve a screen so you could ask the so what question, does that matter? Well, one way to consider whether, there, whether it matters is, is it related to mental health and happiness? So to kind of flip the question around, what do happy teens do with their time? We could look at this in a number of ways. Um, I'm gonna kind of give you the overall picture with lots of activities, because they ask a lot of different um, ways teens spend their time outside of school in this survey. You can see that on the left. And the way I have this set up is the positive numbers, that means the increased risk of that teen saying that he or she is unhappy if they spend a lot of time on the activity versus less. So for example, those who spend a lot of time online, 20 hours a week or more, are about 45% more likely to say that they're unhappy. Similar for social media, a little bit less for gaming, texting, TV, and then the lowest for video chat. But these blue bars are all things that involve a screen. They're all linked to more unhappiness and thus less happiness. So what about homework? Well, that actually goes the other way toward more happiness instead. So teachers love that, but it's very small. So there's something for everyone, including students and parents. Working at a paid job, reading newspapers, magazines, and books, 
in-person social interaction with friends, attending religious services, sports and exercise, and getting enough sleep. So these yellow bars, all things that don't involve a screen, and they're all linked to less unhappiness and thus more happiness. Here's the other piece of the puzzle. With the exception of TV, these blue bars are all things that iGen does more compared to previous generations when they were teens. The yellow bars are all things that they do less compared to other generations at the same age. What about more serious mental health issues? So that ninth through 12th grade survey looks at a number of items looking at depression and suicide risk factors. It doesn't have as comprehensive a list of activities, but we can still get a view of how time use relates to mental health. So those who spend, for example, three hours a day or more on certain electronic devices are 35% more likely to have one of these risk factors. TV also ups the risk, but not by as much. Sports and exercise and getting enough sleep go substantially in the other direction. They are potential protective factors. And I always wanna make clear in these analyses, we don't know causation. Um, this could certainly be a case of, in some cases, it's the kids who are unhappy and depressed, thus spend more time on devices and less time on other things. But there are experimental and longitudinal studies pointing in the direction that it's probably some of both, maybe even leaning toward more of it going from the direction of using the devices, uh, using social media, and that leading to the unhappiness or depression. So that's our picture of iGen and the challenges that they have faced up to this point. And then of course, 2020 happened. So with all of the challenges we're facing now in our families, it's a good thing to know where iGen started from, but also that's the, one of the things that we can discuss is what does that mean for this situation? What will this situation mean um, for this generation's future? And what should we be doing as parents to help them out? So let's uh, hear some questions. So I'm not seeing questions in, in chat, so you may have to turn that on or I'll stop sharing my screen, maybe then they'll come. So Jean, let me begin just by um, asking you um, one kind of follow on question. And thank you so much for that, um, that great uh, summary of so much of your of your uh, important research in this topic. But the, one quick question is, wh why do you think um, spending time on social media has been more challenging for girls um, than boys? What's sort of the basic story there from your perspective? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and we just had a, had a paper a couple months ago on that, that sure enough, if you look at that link between you know, happiness and, and mental health and social media use, that link is stronger for girls than for boys. Um, so it, it appears that um, either the girls who are depressed are spending more time on social media, and that doesn't happen as much for boys, or that the social media time is more toxic and it has a bigger impact on um, happiness and, and mental health among girls. And I think there's a number of possibilities for why um, that is true. Um, some of it is just based in you know, developmental psychology that we know at that age that um, for girls, popularity and those social relationships kind of in, just in the way that social media um, quantifies them has a much, it just has a bigger impact on them. It's a bigger deal um, for them. So um, I think it's uh, that kind of developmental factor is going on. And then there's also, you know, some of these other things that social media really heightens. So concerns around body image being one of the big ones because there's all this emphasis on getting exactly the right selfie, exactly the right looks. You can get the likes, you can get the followers. It puts a lot of pressure on girls. Um, just so many of those things around the images are important. Great. The second question that I had for you um, is, you know, as you know, some of your, your scholarly critics would argue that 
Um, screen time only explains a small percentage of the variation outcomes like anxiety and depression. How do you respond to your critics? Something else too, just sort of the, also kind of the larger ecological shift that, um, you know, their concerns doesn't really, um, or, you know, intersect with. Yeah, so I, and, and thanks for those, those points. I think that, that hits, you know, a, a lot of it. Um, so first, there's two somewhat different questions here. So there's the question of what effect does this have on an individual level? And I get to that in a second in terms of, you know, individual people spending a lot of time on screens and what impact does that have on mental health? What relationship does it have with mental health? So that's important, but it's also important to focus on this at a group or generational level that, you know, take an example, and we'll take a girl since we're just discussing girls in social media. Uh, let's call her Emily. So Emily, Emily actually decided social media was not for her. So she's not spending any time on social media at all. So on an individual level, social media isn't having an impact on her. You know, if you look at that in the, in the studies, nothing, because she doesn't spend any time on it. But social media still has an impact on her. And these changes in terms of technology and smartphones in general have still impacted her because she's not on social media, well, she might feel left out and lonely for that reason, because she's not on it. Also, who is she going to go out with when all of her friends are at home on Instagram on a Saturday night? So the whole culture has shifted, that it's just not the norm anymore to go out with your friends, spend time face to face. It's the norm to be on social media. So um, it actually means that as social media became even more mandatory, that oddly, it kind of had a bigger impact. Like it, it, the, the individual level impact actually ended up getting kind of washed out because it's having this impact at the level of the group. And that really gets heightened, especially when you're talking about teens and you know, high school students where their peer group is so important to them and their happiness and mental health and where they are moving in peer groups, you know, much more than, than adults or even you know, younger kids, that their peer group has such a big influence on them. So what their peer group is doing is gonna have an impact on them uh, especially socially. So that's, an, that's one part of it. And then, you know, on the individual level, it's interesting you'd mentioned, you know, some, some of the critics here. I actually have um, um, a paper coming out on Friday that um, breaks down exactly why some of these other analyses find such small effects. You know, if you throw everything together, put all screen time together, you throw in TV, you throw in all of it together, you look at boys and girls together, um, you do a, a number of other uh, analytical choices, they sy systematically washes it out. Um, if you zero in on girls in social media, there actually is a pretty substantial effect size that's considerably larger uh, that's, than what's been reported in some of these analyses. So that's the first piece of it. Um, and the other is, it all depends on how you ask the question. So if you ask the question the way they do, what's the percent variance explained? We don't have to get in the weeds with the statistics of it, except to say, that's not the question parents want to know the answer to, or policymakers or teens themselves. They don't want to know, oh, among all the vast universe of things that might cause anxiety and depression, including genetics, what percentage can we put on social media or smartphones or technology? Well so much of that we can't change we can't change the genetics we we're born with we can't change you know the past you know things that happened to us in the past but we can change our lifestyle and so what we really want to know the answer to is if i use social media a little bit or a lot what are my chances of for example being depressed and the answer to that across tons of studies is it doubles from light social media use to heavy that risk of depression doubles and some of that may be reverse causation but do we really want to take that risk of saying, hey, let's just let everybody you know, spend five, six hours a day on social media? Not one hour, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. That's a low level of use by current standards. It's when you get to those higher levels of use, that's when the risk of mental health issues really ends up being much higher. So the final question that I'm going to ask, and I'll turn it over to our audience, and you can look at the, the chat questions that they've yeah, to put up, is obviously, you know, in the midst of this pandemic, when everyone's, you know, cooped up in their homes, you know, I think almost every family, including mine, that's 
been more restrictive in its approach to technology is sort of, you know, loosened up a little bit with, you know, with the kids. Um, and so what I'm wondering is sort of in this new pandemic environment um, where a lot of us are sort of quarantined at home, what, what things should we be more relaxed about when it comes to screen time and, you know, electronic activities? And what things should we actually still try to kind of um, hold the line on? You know, how would you distinguish between sort of the good tech in a sense and the bad tech, you know, in, in a world where we have to do a lot more online, including schooling? Um, and also we're trying to often reach out to, you know, parents, in-laws, friends, you know, other folks who need some kind of social connection, in this case, online. So how do you think about sort of good tech and bad tech amidst this yeah. pandemic? Yeah. Yeah, great, great question. I mean, obviously, you know, we don't want to necessarily let, nothing is all good or all bad, but it is true. And you can see, you could see that in some of those graphs that I showed that there's definitely gradations to this. So in terms of, you know, what, what things are probably better and on the better side, video chat. So FaceTime, Zoom, like we're doing now, um, Skype, um, some, some way, whatever program you want to use, whatever works for you, where you're seeing the other person's face, you're talking in real time, that it's synchronous, and that you have that ability to be able to have a real conversation with somebody. It's, it's still not the same as being in person, but it is the closest that we can get right now. So for keeping in touch with, with family and, and friends, for your kids to keep in touch with you know, their friends and, and their schoolmates, um, that's really the best. That's, that's the closest that we can get. Um, and I, I think that's very unlikely you know, to be harmful. So I think um, that's really where the emphasis should be. And then in terms of what to cut back on, maybe cut back on social media because that not in real time has those pressures around gaining likes and followers has, you know, all of that just hasn't changed and is, you know, just as, as potentially toxic as ever. And again, it, it, especially for, you know, high school and up 14, 15 and up, it doesn't necessarily have to mean no use of technology, but it should not mean, oh, we're off school. That means you can spend all day on Instagram. Still not the best of ideas. Right. Okay. Well, we have a number of questions on chat. I think, can you see those on your screen? Yeah. Um, okay. So let's just, you yeah, can go just ahead. start to pick ones that you think would be helpful for, uh, you know, for the group to hear your response to. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one, one question is about age groups and so younger kids versus older groups. And, um, you know, we need more data on that to try to figure out, um, you know, is, for example, social media more harmful for, you know, a 11 year old versus a 16 year old. We do have a little bit of data on that and probably yes. Uh, and if you want to start somewhere, it's actually the law that your kids are not supposed to have a social media account in their own name until they are 13 years old. So we could start by kind of enforcing the existing law or using that law as a great excuse as a parent of, hey, you know, you're actually not supposed to do this till 13. Maybe it should be 15 or 16 instead. You know, it depends on your family situation, your particular kid, everything else. But that's at least one place to start. Um, the good news is, because I looked at this in one um, big um, study that's done by the, the Census Bureau, they had parent reports for kids of all ages from zero to 17 and looked at how much time they, they spent on a variety of um, screen activities and then how it related to well-being, including issues around anger and staying on task as, as well as mental health. And um, I was kind of surprised by the results of that, that the effects were actually the largest for teenagers. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was gonna be the largest for the smaller kids, but I think it's because for the smaller kids, it's TV and videos, which is not as strongly correlated with unhappiness and mental health issues as say social media, which is often what the older kids are doing. So um, I think that also kind of gets to that question of, um, you know, what can we, what, what is not as bad? Lying around watching movies all day, maybe also not the best, but a little bit more of, of that is not as likely um, to have a negative impact as more hours 
um, you know, down internet wormholes and on social media. Um, so here's another question about um, socioeconomic status. So this is always the, the challenge in, in this, this type of, of research is to, you know, the question is around, well, you know, some of these protective factors, some of these, you know, better things that, you know, lower SES populations often don't have as much access to those. That, and that, that's true. And that's just, uh, you know, um, a function of, um, you know, the way, the way things are set up. That's not necessarily a function of the technology, but it's true, especially for a lot of parents that sometimes technology is kind of the only resort that, you know, in normal times that, um, you know, kids doing sports leagues is expensive. Um, there's not as many of those options and technology is quote free. So it makes it, it easier. So, so I, you know, it used to be that there was this internet gap of um, higher SES had more access and now it's kind of flipped around that it's um, even the opposite, that it's a bigger challenge um, for the families who don't have as many resources. Um, but I think that has to be kept in mind. I, I will mention that the studies that I'm drawing from, because they're nationally representative, we do um, have people from all economic backgrounds and we can look to see if the effects are the same or different um, you know, across those economic status, and, and they are. We see them in, in every group and people from every background. Let's see. Um, so here's a question. I get this one a lot from parents when I give talks about doing schoolwork um, on computers. And of course, that was happening, you know, before the pandemic situation. It's happening even more now. Well, you know, these, these, um, most of the data that we have, including what I showed you today, looks at leisure time. It looks at leisure time technology use and leisure time social interaction and so on. And it doesn't look quite as much at um, is there an impact on using technology to do schoolwork. So I mean kind of the closest we can get is you saw that correlation between homework and, and happiness and it's pretty much a wash. Um, you know I, I, I it's the same thing for adults at work that we may be doing more things on on a screen. Um, we don't have great data on that. We don't really know right now um, if that is gonna be more negative. Um, my best guess is probably not as much as the leisure time use, simply because you're usually doing something productive when you're doing the work. And I mean, it's just one example. We do know from some studies that say reading a textbook you know, in paper or, or say, you know, the online more interactive version, if anything, more interactive online version might be a little bit better. Um, in classrooms, in-person classrooms, remember those, um, it looks like there's some data suggesting being technology free in that environment might be helpful. But for doing homework at home, like reading and writing, it doesn't really seem like that would, would have much of an impact, but we need more data on that. Um, while you're looking up those questions, may I also just jump in with a question about yeah. sleep. And I mean, I, I think a yeah. lot of people's schedules have been kind of thrown off by the quarantine. Um, but what do we know about technology and sleep and adolescents' emotional well-being too? Yeah, um, you know, when when I give my my full full version of this talk to the parents of of high school and middle school students, I always say if you want to take just one thing home from the talk, it should be this that we should not let technology interfere with sleep. And number one on that is no devices in the bedroom overnight. So no phones, no tablets after lights out. And that is just, it's really crucial. We have so much research from sleep labs on this. Um, getting enough sleep is so important for physical and mental health that this is one thing that we can do that's relatively easy is get devices out of the bedroom. Um, what a lot of people ask me is, well, wait a second, I have to have my phone in my bedroom overnight because it's my alarm clock. Well, I have some advice for you, buy an alarm clock. You can buy it on Amazon on your phone and then put your phone away and get a good night's sleep. Um, and there are other things um, that you can do before you go to bed other than look at your phone. So that's the other piece. 
is we really shouldn't be looking at our devices within about an hour of bedtime because they're very psychologically stimulating and they are physiologically stimulating as well. The blue light from the devices shines into our eyes, tricks our brains into thinking that it's still daytime and then we don't get, uh, we can't get the melatonin production, that's a sleep hormone, to fall asleep quickly and get a good night's sleep. So that's the other element. Um, and if you're wondering as a parent, well, do I have to like rest the phone out of their hands? Well, I suppose, but you can also put parental controls on phones. iPhones and Android phones have this worked into the operating system now where you can say limit the amount of time they spend on certain apps, but you can also just shut down the device completely. So I mentioned, you know, my 13 year old doesn't have her own phone, but she does have a laptop for doing schoolwork. Um, and at 8.30, so her bedtime is nine, so we want you know, some relaxation before, and she really ends up going to bed more like 9.30. That laptop, it's a brick. It just shuts off and doesn't work anymore. So that's one concrete step that you can take is just kind of cut that off and then at least we're preserving sleep. Even if, you know, during this time we're working, we're trying to get work done, it's much harder to, you know, get around some of the, the screen time limits. We can at least preserve sleep at night. All right, um, so let's see. So this is a great question. I, I get this one a lot. What about parents using their smartphones? Is that having an effect on kids? There's, there's some really great, great research by um, Elizabeth Dunn and Costa Kushlap that's looked at this about the effect of having the phone during a face-to-face -face social interaction. So they looked at friends at a restaurant and they also looked at parents interacting with children. So what happens is when that phone is accessible, it interferes with people's enjoyment and engagement in that face-to-face -face social interaction. And again, you know, we need more stuff done on this, but this is certainly what I hear from pediatricians, for example. So they're of course worried about, you know, screen time in, in kids, but they're also worried about, especially for younger kids, what happens if you know, parents are on the phone all the time? And then what happens to language development and interaction? And it's tough, you know, I, my, my youngest kid is eight, but I remember all too well what it's like to have a toddler and you, know, you need a break. I get, you know, the, totally get the temptation um, you know, to be on the phone and, and, and you know, not be playing with the, the two-year-old every second because it, it could be exhausting. But still, there has to be some of that time curved out, carved out where, okay, we're gonna put the phone away and preserve that. Um, and for family dinners, that's another example of let's just have some time when everybody, including the adults, we're gonna focus on that. I think the, the parents using the phone, probably a little bit less of a problem for teenagers, simply because you know teens wanna be talking to their friends and being out with their friends, but still parental relationships still really important, still really important for teens. And they have to be able to talk to you and trust you when it's time for them and not necessarily time for you. So um, it, it, can, it can interfere with those relationships as well. Okay, let's see. Um, all right, so here's another question. You know, how are we gonna define screen time? Are we just gonna look at social media? What about reading? What about texting? You know, what about FaceTime? So you saw that a little bit in that one graph that there's definitely gradations here that internet use and social media are the most strongly correlated with unhappiness and in another study also depression, but gaming, TV, texting, um, video chat, not quite as much. And you know, it's still not as good as the real thing and being in the same room as somebody and being face to face you know, in person with somebody, but there are definitely gradations in, in screen time here that, that are showing up in several of these big data sets. And as I mentioned, I do think, especially now, video chat's the closest we can get. So, mm. you know, in my opinion, if your kid wants to chat with grandma for an hour on FaceTime, absolutely go for it, because you're probably not going over to their house for dinner anymore. Right. Um, right. And then same thing with their, with their schoolmates um, and, and others. If they want to call them on, on FaceTime um, or, you know, another platform, that's, that's, that's a good thing right now. All right. So I think that's most of the questions. Um, anything else that you think we should cover, Brad? I guess the only other question that kind of jumps out is, has there been anything else that's come out since mid-March that's been sort of tracking the change, perhaps from Pew, that you've seen? Kind of, do we have any kind of 
um, data that's sort of giving us a sense of where we're headed on this issue um, since the lockdowns began, basically? That is a great question, and that is the study that I want to do, but I have to figure out how to, how to get a panel of teens and get funding for that. So maybe we could talk about that later because okay. I really want to know that. And I'm, I know lots of other parents do as well to try to figure out what does mental health look like now? And what does screen time look like now? And how are teens doing? Because I'm, I'm concerned about this. Uh, I was concerned about mental health before this. It was already at these very, very um, problematic levels. So, and probably, as far as I can tell, one of the reasons it got to those problematic levels was tons of screen time and not as much time uh, with people in person. So I really wonder what it looks like right now. It, yeah. The one buffer, I have to give one piece of good news because I do believe this, is that I would bet teens are getting more sleep because yeah. they're not having to get up really early for school. Right. Um, they're probably finally getting enough rest and that may help offset some uh, of these negative effects, but there's, there's so many things right now. It's, it's not just, you know, we, we, they can't go out and see their friends in person, which is especially hard for teens. Um, and there's all of the economic worries, all of the anxiety around the virus. There's uncertainty. We don't know when things are going to open up. You know, there's, there's a lot of pressures on mental health right now. And I'm, I'm glad there's at least one possible positive with sleep. Right. I guess the, the final question that I would ask you is to sort of reflect more broadly on how you think the pandemic and the quarantine is affecting adolescent uh, mental health. And obviously, on the one hand, you could sort of imagine that it's having just one, it's sort of one more way in which they're likely to be experiencing anxiety and depression. But on the other hand, if you kind of take seriously the kind of argument that Jonathan Haidt's been making in a variety of venues before the pandemic, you know, where in some ways it seems like, you know, teens were, were not being exposed to sort of a healthy level of, of sort of risk and danger and, you know, other kinds of challenges in their normal worlds. I mean, now they're exposed to a sort of a massive series of, of threats and dangers and that maybe in a kind of paradoxical way that will realign their expectations and their sense of anxiety. So do you have any thought on, on how this may kind of net out for teenagers when it comes to um, things like anxiety and depression in the next you know, year or two or three with adolescents? Yeah, it's a really intriguing question. And um, there's, there's so many possibilities. And um, that's one of them. And I think it just, it, it depends on how it goes. And I can, I can really see both sides of this, that on the one hand, teens are actually getting less experience with independence now because they're at home with their parents. So they have even less of an opportunity to you know, go out, um, you know, hang out with their friends, um, you know, get that driver's license, have that paid job, you know, all, of, all of those types of things. They're, they're, for the most part, less able to be able to do those things and, and have those experiences uh, with independence uh, and being out of the house. On the other hand, you're right. There's this interesting thing right now of we had so much anxiety and depression in, let's say, you know, 2018 when the economy was pretty good. You know, there wasn't um, huge external threats. wasn't a pandemic like there is now. Um, you can make the case that it was such a, you know, a, so many uh, variables around kids have gotten better. Um, you know, you, you've done some of the, the work on um, some of the, the turnaround in, uh, you know, more two-parent families, Ch child poverty's gone down. There's, there's a, a lot of these really good indications for kids and teens, yet we still have these high levels of anxiety and depression, which, you know, that's what pushed me toward, well, it has to have probably something with technology because it's so surprising. We have the, these levels when things are, a lot of things objectively are, are pretty good. And now they're not. So that's the question of, is this going to be one of those experiences where, yeah, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger if you make it through this. And I don't know. I, right. it, it's different. Pandemics are different from a terrorist attack or a war or, or something else, because what we're all being asked to do is sit at home and watch Netflix. Um, it's just, it's kind of different from something where, you know, there are some collective actions that we can take but it's 
it's just not quite the same. And so it'll be very interesting to see how, how it plays out because I, I completely agree that there's lots of these possible avenues and, and time, time will tell and we'll see. And if, if it ends up being, this is something that draws us together and gives people a purpose in life, then good. Maybe this will be the thing that will actually turn around some of those trends. Um, but I'm still, I'm still worried because I'm not confident that will be the outcome and we'll see. Okay, Jean, thanks very much for being with us at IFS tonight. We're very grateful uh, for your time and we wish you and your family the best at navigating um, this pandemic and all that's, that's, that's now coming upon us. So thanks very much.